Hello and welcome to the SHA-1 Performance Quest Episode 1. Uh, this is Byron speaking and I've recently begun to learn Rust and uh, the first thing I want to tackle is to make sure I've got a SHA-1 implementation available because if you look around uh, you will see that there's no cryptlib or hashlib um, there yet that would include a SHA-1 for Rust. The code is based on the work of several other authors and I think it has gone through quite a few revisions. Therefore, we will put on yet another revision and see what we can do to make it real, real fast. Let's have a look at our benchmarks here. I've made a benchmark before of the SHA-256 implementation that comes with the Rust compiler. And as you can see, it does 180 megabyte. One call to cargo bench later, we shall see what the SHA-160 or SHA-1 implementation does for us. 120 megabyte per second, that is subpar in every which way and I'm going to show you why I think that. Here I show how existing SHA-1 algorithms compare so that we know what we want to achieve at some point. Uh, this implementation was written in Go. It's a very simple program that really just reads from std in and as you can see, it can process 450 megabyte worth of nulls every second, which is pretty damn good, especially con considering that the system version of it, which is written in C, will do only 400 megabyte per second. Quite impressive, and uh, I believe there is a long way to go for us to beat that. Let's get started. I believe the code base will grow quite a bit, you know, that's always how it is, so it wouldn't certainly be a bad idea to separate our tests into a different file. Um, as you can see, I have trouble finding a good name uh, and decide that I go with an easy and simple test.rs, where all of our tests should be placed at some point. Um, the module definition can just be removed now because we are in a module called tests already. Um, I'm not quite sure if I should leave the config test in here or if Cargo is smart enough. Since I have to uh, declare the test module in my lib.rs though, I realize that it's probably best to just keep this um, compiler de definition there in order to prevent this to be compiled when we um, are outside of test mode. Okay, let's try to run the test right now and uh, it should all work, right? Okay, there is no test that was run apparently, which might be because everything is kind of file centric. I mean, the single file lib.rs is kind of the hub from where everything is pulled in, right? And right now the compiler doesn't know anything about our new test file. So all we have to do to make this work is add a module definition mod tests in this case will just pull in our test file. There are multiple ways uh, that tests can exist here. Um, test.rs is one of them. And as you can see, now the tests are actually run, in this case the benchmarks. Looking back at our reference implementation of SHA-256, I mean that definitely has been done by, by serious guys, the Rust programmers themselves, we can easily see that they are, well, not a lot faster, but they are faster. 60 megabyte per second faster, and uh, they have an algorithm which is technically slower than SHA-1. I mean, SHA-1 does 450 megabyte per second. SHA-256 in the Go implementation, I think, does only 350 or 300. So it's, they should actually be slower than us, but apparently they do something differently. To get a bit closer to figuring out why we are much slower than we should technically be, I think it would be best to have comparable tests. So I'm now basically stealing a test case from SHA-256 that is feeding the hasher 64 kilobytes of input at a time. Because our current test, I think it doesn't do that. It feeds uh, smaller chunks, pieces of text, like one kilobyte at a time. And the fastest test that SHA-256 has, after all, is the one that has the biggest chunk. Makes sense because with each chunk fed, there certainly is some overhead involved and the smaller the chunks, the slower the overall performance, or the worse the overall performance, you could say. And just 30 seconds later, the new test works for us and shows that if I execute the benchmarks actually, that we are now a tiny bit faster. 
How can I say that? Well, I kind of know that in advance because the power of editing. 180 megabyte per second, that's as fast as SHA-256. If we remember, SHA-256 is technically slower than us and there's nothing, no one ever can do about that. So there must be some something we can do to actually outpace the SHA-256 implementation. For that, we should find a way to, well, we should find the differences, right? That's the thing. What do they do differently? Um, that makes them so much faster. Let's try to find out. And just about a few minutes later, I find myself actually implementing yet another test. Why? Because I had no storyboard or script to follow when doing this, uh, just free, freebie working basically. Uh, so what I wanted to do here is to have another test that allows me to change the slice size. And you know, I wanted to programmatically do that and kind of feed it in and I wanted to do that in a very idiomatic manner. So no for loops, no nothing, but iterators, iterators, iterators. Yeah, I always have to look this up because uh, there are so many different versions of it. And I mean, that's in by no means um, a critical comment because you know, that's just how it is. And you have to learn that. Um, it's just that I can never remember. I mean, I'm new to that and maybe one day uh, I will just natively use it. Until then, I will probably look up the, the documentation more often than, than I actually want, even though it's gorgeous documentation. I mean, look at that. It's actually fun to, to read it and to dive in. At the end of my lecture and a few fights against the borrow checker, I came up with something that works. You see it on the left there. And, um, but wait, it doesn't actually work. Warning, unused results, which must be used. Iterator adapters are lazy and do nothing unless consumed. So how awesome is that? It's just a warning, but uh, the unused result warning is one of the greatest ever, especially in conjunction with the iterators. The cheapest thing I have found to actually consume such an iterator is to count. You know, that just counts the amount of items in there. And I wonder if there's a better way because that aggregates a sum and you know it, it increments a counter which costs and this shouldn't cost anything if I just want to consume. Of course you could also write a loop that does nothing but you know where's the point if you use iterators. Plenty of time has passed and I've integrated the SHA-256 implementation that comes with Rust compiler temporarily and just for my personal use into the hasher library that also contains SHA-1. Um, just to have a better comparison. So now I do have plenty of benchmarks and I realize that, well, benchmarks won't really help me to figure out hotspots. I mean, in this case, I can look at the code and probably have a good understanding of where hotspots could be, but usually for that kind of stuff, you know, benchmarks are for regression tests to see if something gets slower or faster, but for making something faster, you need a profiler. And in the C, C++ and even Go world, there is profiler support and I was just having a quick look at how this would look like and uh, yes, I believe to know that Rust in fact supports Valgrind and Valgrind is not only a profiler, it's also a uh, memory analyzer. But to be honest, uh, to me it felt like something I don't want to jump in right now and uh, I aborted the operation after just a quick, quick browse. Um, I believe this should work, but I don't have, I don't really have the, the experience with Vagrant on the command line to know that I will get something useful out of there, especially in conjunction with Rust. At the end of this session, I basically managed to restructure SHA-1 a bit to make it more maintainable, to allow me to more easily add benchmarks and tests to more easily understand the existing code because that will be necessary for what's coming next. After all, we just know how fast or slow the current implementation is, but so far I did not attempt anything to change that. Well, I believe this commit is a good marker to actually end this episode and I do hope that you will join me for the next one where we'll try to change the design of SHA-1 to make it faster. Will I succeed? We shall see.